Good afternoon, and welcome to Turning the Web Up to 11. I'm Chris Wilson. I'm a developer advocate on the Chrome team, and I'm here to take you on a journey through the Web Audio API. So if you didn't know what I was going to talk about, now you do. Um, I wanted to start by showing why I'm so excited about the Web Audio API. When I first ran across the Web Audio work, um, I got really excited because for the last couple of years, I've gotten really interested in building and using software synthesizers drum machines, all kinds of production stuff on desktop and also on tablets. And I'd gotten really excited about this. I wanted to start building my own. And I, as I looked at the Web Audio API, it looked super easy to do, super interesting. And I actually very quickly realized that most of building a software synthesizer with Web Audio ends up being a really big user interface chore. And I'm not a great UI designer. You'll probably notice that in, during my deck. But so I'd set my sights on a different challenge, because I wanted to do something that was really pretty heavy duty with audio processing. So I decided I would set my sights on making robot voices, or more, more particularly, um, building a vocoder and trying to replicate Styx's seminal 1983 hit, Mr. Roboto. And I'm actually happy to report that I've managed to do this. Um, this is actually a vocoder that I built. It's up on GitHub right now. There's a link to it at the end of the deck, so you can go play with it yourself or uh, fork it and do all kinds of interesting things with it. So how many people know what a vocoder is or how it works? Yeah, the guy on the web audio team doesn't actually get to raise his hand, but I kind of figured. So I don't want to get really deeply into vocoder theory or anything. Basically, what a vocoder does is it takes one signal, um, generally called the modulator. It's usually a vocal sample, something like this. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent. And it maps the frequency characteristics of that sound over time. It chops it up into frequency bands, and then it watches the, how much energy is in each frequency band, and it maps it onto a different signal, the carrier signal, which is usually a synthesized sound, something like this. And I had to tell the audio guys beforehand, no, that's not something going wrong. That is actually what it's supposed to sound like right now. It sounds really awful, right? But when you actually map the frequency characteristics onto that sound, it ends up sounding kind of like this. It's kind of cool. It's actually somewhat recognizable. Now, the interesting thing about this code to me, that, that I, after having written it, is that this is not being pre-computed. This is actually happening live. In fact, I can change characteristics, like I can detune the voices being used and change how it sounds. Or I can also change what voices are being used to produce it. So if I grab and bump up and use a different sample or something like that. So I have a lot of control over what's going on. In fact, the only bit of my JavaScript code that's running while this is going is the stuff used to animate the vocoder bands and how the frequency bands are jumping around and you know, the input and output signals. So the ability to build rich audio applications like this, because by the way, I'm not an audio engineer. I'm not a digital signal processing expert or anything. Um, it did take me a lot of trial and error to build this. But the ability to build rich audio apps like this without having a degree in audio engineering is why I'm so excited about the processing capabilities here. And I will stop that, because you can go play with it yourself. Whoops. Click on my slides here. So you might start out by asking, like, why do we even need another API? We already have the HTML5 audio element. Um, and I love the HTML5 audio element, because it wraps everything about audio, loading, decoding, and playing audio, all up into one easy declarative step. Right? You stick an audio tag in. You tell it whether you want to show the controls or not, whether you want to preload it, give it the source, and you're good to go. Like I can I'm going to turn my sound down just a little here. Um, I click the button. Oh, I can turn it back up. I click the button, and it plays the sound. In fact, I even get built-in scrubbing of the sound, so I can, if I stop hitting my right button, 
I can scrub it to part of the sound and hit play. Now this is great, but the thing that you don't get from the HTML5 audio element is you don't get sample accurate control over when the sound is going to be played. And it really struggles with scalability. When you have a whole bunch of sounds that you want to play all at the same time or very close to each other, it's kind of a challenge to get it to scale to that. Now, the Web Audio API is designed a little bit differently. It's really designed around this idea of having very precise timing of lots of sounds. So I can play the same sound sample, but I can also play it a lot of times. And it, it's very precise in timing as to when it's playing um, exactly when I hit the, the button. The Web Audio API also provides a really rich audio pipeline for building effects and filters and routing audio around in, in different powerful ways. So adding an effect to that same sound file is really easy. And then finally, the Web Audio API builds in a bunch of hooks so you can analyze and visualize and kind of manipulate the data on the fly as well. So it's really pretty easy to build something like a visual analyzer. Like this stuff is, I actually built this visual analyzer special for this talk, and it didn't take very long. We're going to walk through the code a little bit later. So looking at the API from the top down, it's kind of surprising that it's actually designed to be a relatively high-level API. It's really pretty easy to do basic tasks in the API, like play sound now, playing a sound. Like that's the code for it right there. That's all that I needed to do to play that sound because I'd already had the buffer loaded, and we'll talk about that. But even better than that, the effects and filters engine doesn't require you to be a DSP engineer. If you told me that in order to build that vocoder, I had to go build my own FFT algorithm implementation and come up with a bunch of matrices and transforms and stick it all together, I, I would have walked away and done something else, frankly. Like, math is not my favorite thing to do on a, a sunny afternoon, so I probably would have figured out something else. But if you want to do that, if you want to get right down into the guts and do your own processing in JavaScript on the fly, you absolutely can do that with the Web Audio API too. But most of the effects engine and certainly the routing engine that we provide in the implementation, it uses a separate high priority thread. It uses native implementation of, of FFTs and things like that. And that way we can resist problems like glitching. So if you have an application that has a pretty rich visuals and nice animation here. I never sync anyone when I do this. Um, but this actually has really rich sound. It's in 3D, so it's, you actually hear the balls clicking together in the appropriate place and everything. It works better with headphones, obviously, than uh, in the room. But you could tell the sound wasn't interfering with the audio, and the audio wasn't interfering with the sound. And this is really critical to not have these, these things uh, interact with each other accidentally. Now, when you look at what you need to build gaming, because there are really two major scenarios that we're super interested in, music applications and gaming. Gaming has a lot of kind of features that are expected for high-end console games. You expect to see things, like I talked before, about very precise timing of audio elements and simultaneous sounds. But you also expect to be able to do things like position sound in 3D, have automatic effects happen like Doppler shift when the siren races past you and the pitch seems to change because of, of the physics of it. You also want to be able to do things like filtering effects so that if you're doing a live chat, you want it to sound like it's coming over the radio or over a telephone. So I can take that same sample I did earlier Play sound now. and filter it so it sounds like it's coming over a really kind of crappy quality telephone. And of course, replicating uh, acoustic environments. Like if you fire your BFG 9000 in a huge hall, you expect it to sound a little different than when you, if you fire it in a small room. And of course, you need the ability to create rhythms and sequences and things like that, but also do automation do automated fade-ins, fade-outs, that sort of thing. On top of that, for music applications, 
You also need to be able to generate sound. You need oscillators. You need things like dynamics processing and distortion and things like that. And of course, this is where frequency and waveform analysis gets really interesting. So I want to start diving in to how we make this happen with the Web Audio API. Um, this is an application that I wrote. I'm going to use this multiple times during the talk. It's also posted on GitHub. It's also posted publicly, so you can just go run it. Um, it basically is something that I built to let me kind of explore visually the Web Audio API. So the first thing to understand is that the Web Audio API works on the concept of a node graph. You create nodes, so I just created an audio buffer source node, and you connect them. And in this case, I'm going to connect it to the speakers, because you need to connect everything to the speakers if you want to hear sound. And I'll hit play. Yay. So you get the, the basic idea, create nodes, connect them together, hit play. Now, these node graphs can be varying complexity. You know, what I just had here that just went away is, was actually really simple. It just had two nodes, the source node and the speaker destination node that I played. This is a little bit more complex node graph, but if you work through it one piece at a time, it's pretty straightforward. There's a few sources, there's a few effects, they're mixed together in submixes, and then it all goes through a compressor and gets played. Um, that vocoder app that I ran in the beginning, by the way, is a really complex node graph. It has uh, somewhere around 420 nodes, I think, active, like while it's playing the whole time. So you can tell how scalable it is, because that's running on my uh, two-year-old MacBook Pro, and really doesn't make the system sweat even that much. For a while, I was accidentally running two copies at the same time. It's wondering why I got a weird effect, but. So, oops. So I want to start by walking through how to build all of this audio code. I'm not going to dig into the code of the vocoder app. I started trying to do that and realized it's kind of hard to explain um, in an hour. But at the same time, I do want to walk through each of these building blocks and, and help you understand how to use them. Now, you're going to have to bear with me. We have to get through five types before I can start playing with the fun stuff. The first of those is the audio context. The audio context is kind of the root of all things audio. Um, this is kind of similar to a canvas, a 2D canvas context. So this is, you create one of these, and this is where you get access to all of the other fun stuff. First and foremost, of course, this is where you get access to the speakers. And you have to route everything to this destination, to the speakers, in order to have it make sound. Otherwise, you're not plugging the cable into anything, in effect. But we also have methods here to create audio buffers, to decode audio buffers from common file formats like uh, MP3 or WAV or AUG or that sort of thing. And this is also down at the bottom where we create all kinds of different audio nodes. And we're going to walk through each one of those audio nodes. This is a good time to mention, by the way, I show you a lot of interfaces in this talk. Um, these are not the precise interface declarations. I tried to simplify them to make them a little more understandable. Um, and obviously, like, I've cropped a bunch of the audio nodes out of the bottom here. So look in the spec if you want the full, complete version. So this is the first line of web audio applications, or a very early line, I should say. You need to create a new audio context. Um, right now, obviously, we have, we're WebKit prefixed, vendor prefixed. Sooner or later, that will go away as we move the spec through the standards process. Now, the second type is audio node. And I already said uh, Web Audio API is based on the concept of a node graph. Audio node is basically the superclass for all nodes in that graph. In fact, it really only has two things that are super interesting. It has a connect. It has a disconnect. You want to connect a source node to a destination node. You just call source.connect and pass it the destination you want to connect it to. I will point out here, there's a second connect method uh, that takes an audio param. I don't want to get into the implications of that yet, but I did want to call it out because it's going to be important later on. And that leads me to the third type, which is audio param. Now, audio param is a really uh, kind of complex type to understand at first, but it ends up being super, super important. So 
most of the values, the things you would think of as values in the Web Audio API, like the volume on a gain controlling node, for example, they're actually represented as audio params. Now, you can still get and set the value. It's the first thing in the interface declaration. You can go in and grab the value out of there. You can manipulate it, set it to something different, whatever. And that's an easy way to use it, and I do use it that way a lot. But at the same time, you can also do things that schedule it. So you can say, I want to set the value at a particular time in the future. Or, my personal favorite, I want to ramp this over time. I want to set the value to zero now, but I want to ramp it up to one over the course of the next couple of seconds. And we handle that for you under the covers in the Web Audio API. So you get really, really smooth automation because, of course, we can do that very fast. And I will show several examples of how to do that. So we covered the three infrastructure bits of context, nodes, and params. Now I want to talk about sounds. And audio buffer is the first thing to talk about audio buffers. It represents a, um, a decoded buffer of sound. So that means it's actually in memory, and it's, the bits are right there, lined up in a row for you. You can actually access them in here as a float32 array. You can go directly twiddle, get set, whatever you want to do with those bits. You can, of course, also see the sample rate and how long it is, how long the buffer is, and that sort of thing if you want. But if you want to, you can access the data directly. In fact, this set of code creates an audio buffer um, and gets the channel, the, the data, gets a pointer to the data, and then just sets it to random, uh, random numbers. This sounds like a goofy thing to do, but actually this is how, this is how you get white noise. Now, white noise is actually musically useful in a number of cases, like my, the vocoder app uses white noise in one place. Um, so it, you know, it's something that you may want to do. Now, of course, you typically aren't really going to want to directly set these values. You're going to want to load them from somewhere. So usually you'll do something like this. This is using pretty standard XML HTTP request code. Um, I set up a new, uh, new XHR request. I open it with a get. I point it to an MP3 file in this case. The only interesting bits here are I set the response type to array buffer because I want, want to get this back as an array, not as a bunch of plain text. It's an audio file. It's probably not, plain text is not going to be super interesting. And then when it loads, I call the audio context decode audio data method, and I give it that buffer that I just got back from XHR. And when it asynchronous, asynchronously completes, it passes me back a buffer, an audio buffer, that I can then do whatever I want with. Now, what, you might ask, do I do with an audio buffer? Like, it's not a node, you might notice. If you go back to the interface that we had a minute ago, it doesn't derive from node. It's, it's an object in its own right. So what you do is you use an audio buffer source node. An audio buffer source node is a node that we wrap around, or actually we point to an audio buffer. And it's really important to understand this is a one-shot playback node. Audio buffer source node can only be played once. This is really, really super important, which is why I say it multiple times during this slide. Once you've played the audio buffer source node once, you have to throw it away. You don't have to throw away the buffer. Like, the buffer you can keep around and use as many times as you want. In fact, you can share it with multiple audio buffer source nodes that are playing at the same time. When I hit the fire button repeatedly earlier, I only had one copy of that sound buffer I just had multiple buffer source nodes that pointed to it and were playing at the same time. So buffer source node, the, the type points to the buffer that it's playing. It also lets you change the playback rate so you can make it playback faster or slower, uh, meaning you can increase or decrease the pitch. Um, you can loop it, you can tell it when to start playing, and you can tell it when to stop playing. So let's look at how we use these two together. So the top part of this code sample is the code you just saw uh, to do an XML HTTP request, get the data back, call decode audio data, and get a buffer. And the only difference is, once I've gotten the buffer, I call this method bark. And bark creates a buffer source node, points the buffer for the buffer source node to what we just loaded, 
connects it to the speakers, because remember, we have to connect everything to the speakers or we don't hear anything, and then calls node on to start it. And I can make it bark. There's hello world right there. Hello dog, I don't know, whatever. Now, if this were my dog, on the other hand, um, it would be looped because she barks a lot. I didn't actually want to run this for 10 minutes, but she does bark about that long most of the time. Now, there are a couple things that I want to point out here. Um, one thing that I should have mentioned before when I was talking about writing values in is the sound values are actually floating point numbers. It's negative one to one is kind of the, the range that we have, but it's floating point. It's not 16-bit uh, integers, it's not 24-bit integers or 32-bit integers, which if you're heavy into digital sound in the past, you might have expected. The reason is that gives us a lot of um, a lot of play in where the dynamic range gets applied. So we still have a lot of dynamic range. We're not wasting the dynamic range, but it helps us to, to avoid clipping. The second thing here is I've been passing these time values around. Like here I call audiocontext.currentTime plus 600. Um, so time in the Web Audio API is an interesting beast because it's in seconds. It's not in milliseconds but it's a floating point number. And this is really why we used milliseconds for a long time. I imagine that very few of you in the room have not used set timeout at one point or another in web programming. Set timeout takes values in milliseconds. The problem with this is a millisecond is actually a really long time when you're looking at each sample of audio, right? In one millisecond on a you know, CD quality audio, that's 44 and a tenth samples. Like, you're not very precise in that case. So we needed something more precise and went with seconds, not milliseconds. Secondly, you want to grab this from the audio context dot current time. You don't grab it from time dot now or something like that. It's not the Unix epic clock. It actually starts at zero when the context is created. That's not a super useful point in time. It's just, it's more a relative unit than an absolute unit in that sense. But finally, and also critically important, you kind of have to be careful because this is a different clock. It literally may have a different clock crystal that it's running off of because audio hardware systems frequently have a separate crystal that, run, that keeps the audio very stable and the CPU may spin its crystal up or down or something like that for power management reasons. So by now, you know, we're, I don't know, a uh, little under halfway through, and you're thinking that's great. Uh, you've dumped a bunch of types on me, a whole bunch of code, and fundamentally all you did was make a dog bark, and I can loop that in the HTML5 audio tag too. So what have you shown me that's really interesting? Well, first and foremost, you don't usually do code the way that I did it there. Most particularly, you don't usually immediately play the sound buffer when you've loaded it with web audio. It's a, called a buffer for a reason. You want to keep it around for a while. In fact, this talk, I use about a dozen sound samples during the course of this talk, and I've loaded all of them. I loaded them all when the page loaded the first time, and I just hang on to the buffer, and I use them whenever I want. So there are a couple samples um, that I use repeatedly. They're already in memory. I don't need to worry about, are they still there? Do I load them again? Are they going to get cached or not? Now, there is, of course, one other critical difference here, which is the Web Audio API has a lot of audio nodes for processing. We can do a lot of interesting things with the audio once we've started playing it. I just wanted to get out, get out of the way, how do you play something? Because it's actually relatively easy. And by the way, if you want to use the HTML5 audio element, as I did mention before, HTML5 audio supports streaming. And streaming is a critically important thing to do for some types of audio. If you want to play background music for a game, for example, you may not want to load all of that into an in-memory buffer. So here you can take an HTML5 audio element and grab its audio output by calling audio context create media element source, handing it the HTML5 audio or video element, and it grabs the sound output from that tag, from that element, and then you can connect it to wherever you want. You can connect it to the effects pipeline, you can route it, you can change its gain, all kinds of things. So it does integrate very well 
into the Web Audio API as well. So I want to walk through each of the types of processing nodes and what they can do and how to use them. Uh, the first one, and kind of the, the easiest one to knock out first, I guess, is the gain node. And gain node is pretty straightforward. It lets you control the gain, aka volume. And I'll just grab a, drop a sound file in, drop a gain node in, connect the sound file to the gain node, to the speakers. Uh, let's choose a different sound here. OK, so I've got my sound playing. And now I can change the gain values. And it makes it quieter, or makes it a lot louder. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Um, however, it's important to understand gain nodes are fantastically useful and really, really important, because this is how you create a lot of the points in the routing graph. This is how you create things like submixes. If you uh, are implementing a game sound manager, for example, and you're creating a bunch of sounds, uh, effect sounds, like you know, guns firing or whatever, that probably all gets connected to a single gain node that lets you control the effects volume. And then you have a different gain node that lets you control the music volume. And maybe you have a master volume that they both connect to. But all of these routing points frequently are gain nodes because they're an easy thing to, to hang off of. I should also mention, by the way, implicitly, you can make more than one connection at any node connection point. Um, if you connect multiple nodes to one destination, they just get automatically mixed together. So if I have my dog barking, my cat, and I, and I just connect them both to the same destination down below and call node on at the same time, you get them both together. It just mixes them together. And of course, if I connected one node to multiple destination nodes, that also works, like it just automatically fans out. In fact, my vocoder app in the beginning, I mentioned at one point it's a 28-band vocoder. That means one of the nodes fans out to 28 other nodes. And then at the other end, 28 nodes all have to mix back down together into one node. And I just do that by connecting them. I didn't have to do anything special or come up with a special node to do that. Now, I also want to point out, remember I said, you can actually, um, uh, that all the, the things that you would think of it like parameters, like gain on a gain node, are actually audio params. This lets you do automation. So I can do things like this automated fade that I played earlier. Should have played earlier. And it fades it in and fades it out. And I did this simply by saying, I want to start by creating a gain node, inserting it into the path, and then Right now, set the value to zero. In two seconds, I want you to have ramped up to 1.0, and two sec or you know, four seconds from now, I want you to have ramped back down to zero. These are really easy to set up, and th as I said, they happen very, very smoothly because we handle them under the covers at a very high time resolution. Now, my next node type, it's also relatively basic, is a delay node. Now, it's pretty obvious what a delay node does. It delays the audio sent through it. So I'm going to create my delay node and hook it up. And I'll hit play. And the interesting thing is you probably didn't notice anything different. Well, it's because what goes through the node is entirely delayed. So it's not mixing it back together with the original sound. It's only delaying all the audio going through it. So there was an extra 0.2 seconds from when I hit the button to when it played. But of course, that's not really noticeable. Now, if I want it to, to sound like an echo, then I can connect the original source straight to the speaker destination too and play it again. And now you get kind of the echo effect. Now, if you really want what you classically think of as kind of a fading feedback echo digital delay, you want to add a gain node in. Let's move it where we can actually see where the routing goes. And you want to put a cycle through this delay. So the output of the delay goes into the gain node, and the gain node goes back into the delay. 
and a critically important piece is set the gain less than one. And now when I play it, it's going to cycle through this delay gain, delay gain, delay gain until the sound just dies back down to zero. So you can hear how I can build a, a digital delay. In fact, for any studio engineer types uh, in the audience, if you want to build like multi-tap delays, you just stack a few delay nodes in, in parallel. If you want to do things like multi-channel effects like ping pong delay, I'll actually get into that later, um, they're really easy to do because you have kind of the basic toolkit for doing delay and all you have to do is route it in a, an interesting way. Now another amazing thing is that delay time is actually an audio param. That means you can schedule changes to it. You can make changes to it live and things will happen. So if I wanted, wanted to do code like this, I can actually increase the delay time over time and it automatically makes it happen. So hello, 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 hello. Okay, that one didn't sound right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna restart this. For some reason, this demo occasionally decides to be finicky. So I'm gonna try that one again. Hello, 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 hello. There we go. Kind of a subtle effect, but it's basically increasing the delay time over time. Um, I mentioned before, you can also connect audio nodes into audio params, like take the output of an audio feed and pump it straight in as a parameter controller. This is how you do effects like flanging and chorusing, which basically just have an oscillator modulating the display time. Um, I'll have a demo about that uh, up on the net later. I didn't put it in here because it's kind of hard to walk through the code for it. Now, now is the time actually in this, this talk to introduce a really, really good friend of mine, the real-time analyzer node. And I say a really, really good friend of mine because I used these constantly while I was debugging my vocoder application to figure out what was going on in the sound feed. Because it turns out you really cannot debug an audio application by using console.log to spit out sound values. Like, it just doesn't work. Like, you have 44,000 values blow past in a second. You're not going to recognize the pattern and say, oh, yeah, that's a sine wave. So, the real-time analyzer node is what lets you visualize things, like this. So all that this does, you, you can set this up and tell it, I want to get um, an array that represents the frequency band energy. And you can tell it how detailed you want that, that array to be. Or you can say, I want the um, kind of a chunk of the waveform as well. We use the same node to give you both of those features. The frequency data you can ask for is a uint8 or as a float. It's kind of totally up to you and your, your coding how you want to do it. So let's see how we actually do this. So here's how you use it. Um, the frequency buckets, by the way, are split up linearly across zero to the, the Nyquist frequency, which is half of the, the audio context sample rate. So if you say you want you know, 1,024 buckets, then it's going to chop that up um, evenly across zero to probably 22.05 kilohertz. And then at some point in time, what you do is you go to your analyzer and you pass it an array that you've created and you say, give me the byte frequency count data here. And it performs the frequency analysis of the current sound and passes it back to you. And then, of course, you just go in a loop through that array do whatever you want to make it uh, to make something interesting visually, or uh, do interesting analysis, or whatever you want. Um, in in the case of this this visualizer, all I did was I walked through that array and drew little boxes on the screen. But of course, if you do that on a request animation frame timer, then it happens, you know, at the refresh rate of your monitor or whatever, and you can do something that looks very live. Right? You're doing it constantly. You're getting lots of analysis. Please, by the way, don't use set timeout to do this. Set timeout's not a great way to do animation anyways, but it gets even worse in sound sometimes. So now that we've looked at frequency analyzers, um, now we can talk about filter nodes. So filtering is a process that happens in the frequency domain. 
it changes the response across frequencies. So we have a bunch of different types. We have low pass, high pass, band pass, low and high shelving filters, peaking filter, notch filter, and all pass filter. I don't expect you to magically know what all those do or, or care. This actually lets you play with the parameters and see what happens when you change the frequency. When you change from a low pass filter, which lets all the low frequencies through but cuts off the high ones, to a high pass filter, you can see how, it's, how it shifts. It's a neat little graph to play with and gives you some idea of how things work. And by the way, the parameters in this are frequency and Q, or occasionally what's referred to as quality or sometimes resonance um, because it's sort of a related concept. So like here, if I pump up the Q, you can see how it sort of accentuates whatever the frequency is. It's causing a resonance right at that, that spot. Now, this is great. I'm showing you some neat graphs. You can actually hear and see how it sounds by using my neat little demo app here. And don't worry, this is the most complex graph I'm going to draw in this thing on my little trackpad here. So let's create an audio buffer source. Let's grab an analyzer, a filter, and another analyzer. And let's see if I can get these all to fit on the screen at the same time. There we go. Connect. You know, if I'd had time, I would have uh, figured out how to preload these in my app. But All right, let's use our same drum sample and loop it. And you can hear how all the high frequencies are getting cut off on this sound sample. You can actually see it in the difference between the before and after analyzer here. And if I play with the frequency, You can hear it open up, and now I'm pretty much passing through all of the frequencies. But just for kicks, let's crank up the resonance. Okay, so I'm not Paul Oakenfold, um, but you get how this stuff works, and you get the application of these kinds of things. Like, now it's turning into a UI problem to build some really cool DJ tools, which I'm kind of excited about building next. That'll be my next little uh, fun game. Now, I also want to point out, again, frequency and Q, they're both audio params. So you can automate them. You can change these automatically over time. And so I took this, and I took a, the output of a standard, I think it's a triangle wave, and just pumped it straight into a filter. So the original sound is an, an unchanging wave. And I just changed the filter and told it, hey, sweep the filter from 0 to 2,000 hertz um, over the course of two seconds, and then back down to 0. I think I automated the cue, too. So you can do these neat little filter sweeps really, really easily. Like that, that actually is the code snippet pasted out of uh, my JS file. And you can take that same filter and you can use it to process other things. You don't have to have an unchanging sound that you start with. Sorry, I should have cranked that up a little. Let's play it again. So you can do all kinds of fun things by automating those filters as well as just twiddling the values yourself. In fact, Filters are also how you get effects, like I'm talking on a telephone, or I'm talking on an AM radio, or something like that. You can take an, the original sound here, play sound now, which you heard earlier, and all that I do in this other sample is I pump it through a couple of filters to mask off the low and the high frequencies. It turns out a telephone sound is really just the old telephone system chopped off all of the upper and lower frequencies because of the way that they transferred the data across the lines. Play sound now. And you get something like that, just by masking off those, filtering off those frequencies. So now that we've got all these really cool sounds, or the, the tools to build all of them, we need to position them in 3D space. There's a great tutorial on HTML5 Rocks about this. I basically decided I couldn't improve on that a whole lot, so I was just going to show the demo for it and talk through it a little bit. And you'll see as we move around here, hopefully you're getting the, uh, you're hearing the audio move around. 
want to thank the sound guys again for getting the room set up for stereo because that definitely would not have been as impressive otherwise. Um, so the way that you do this is you create an audio panner node. You just pump your sound into an audio panner node and you set its position, its orientation if you want the sound to be directional, and its velocity. And this sounds really complex to do. Obviously, it makes sense for the demo that I just showed you where it's really 3D space. But maybe you just want to take a normal sound and pan it to the left or the right. Well, that's actually really easy to do. You just create a panner node. You set the position to straight ahead. And then you can animate like the x position to, to change where it is left to right. And you end up with something like this. So it's actually really easy to do simple things as well. You don't have to do super complex you know, 3D math to figure out where to position things. This is also, by the way, how you get Doppler effects. That whole set velocity method is to, to set the velocity of an object so that you get these sounds where you can hear the pitch change as something races past you. So given the number of ambulances or, or policemen that I've heard going around on the streets of San Francisco the last couple of days, you hear this a lot. But you expect that sound to change. Like if you were in it playing a game and you raced past the police officer in the game and the pitch of his siren didn't change, you would actually notice. It would be kind of weird. It would be jarring because that's not the way that it works in real life. And this just magically happened. All you had to do was set the velocity of the object and we knew to change the pitch of the, of the object. Now, oops. Now, all of these things, all of these audio panner nodes that may be in play, they're all relative to a listener somewhere. Like, you have to position the person hearing all of these things. And the person hearing all these things um, is a, an attribute of the speakers, in effect. Like, it's an attribute of the entire context. So the audio listener hangs directly off the audio context. There's only one of them. You don't create these. It's always there. And you just set your position or your orientation or velocity. When I moved around in that sound field uh, during the demo a couple seconds ago, I was changing the audio listener properties as well as the visual representation of that. <sighs> so with that, I want to jump to another fun node, the convolver node. So convolution is a process to digitally simulate a space, or, or a process, actually. Um, because you can use this to simulate room ambiance, like the way sound bounces around in this room. This room has kind of a nice response to it. Like, I can hear my voice bouncing off the back wall. Um, but you can also use it to simulate an analog processor, uh, something to, that, you plug, that you use to, to plug an audio signal through. The way that this works is you use these things called impulse response files. And impulse response files can be recorded, like you can literally go into a room like this with a couple of microphones and a speaker, play a set of sounds, and then run that through this convolution processing software. And it creates a sound file that is representative of how this room responds to a sound impulse. Or you can have them generated algorithmically, um, or you can just come up with really wacky ones which usually has very unpredictable results, of course. But fundamentally, in order to, to uh, simulate different responses, um, you have to use this file, a sound file. There are tons of these available on the net freely. Like, you can just go search for impulse response files. Tons of them are out there, lots of hall reverbs and room reverbs and things like that, as well as some really crazy ones. Again, I do want to point out, the output of this node is just the processed signal. And typically, you don't just hear the echoes. You hear the original sound, too. So you probably want to mix these together when you actually use it. Um, but Convolver Node is pretty straightforward because it basically has one property that you really care about. It's a buffer. Remember I said these are impulse response files. They're sound files. You load them the same way you load any other sound sample. You just set it here rather than setting it in an audio buffer source node. So to do this, um, I'm going to use my favorite drum sample that I keep using. 
turn that down a little bit. And so I took my drum sound, I, I created a convolver node, I pumped the drum sound into that convolver node, but also connected it to the speakers, to the destination. So I hear both of them. And then all that I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch what the impulse response buffer is. So I can change it to a hall. I can change it to a spring reverb. The spring reverb, reverb is an old analog processor that literally used springs. And you can kind of hear this weird slapping noise going back and forth. It's a characteristic of spring reverb. You can do a comb filter, which has a really, really awful sound, so I'm not going to stay on that one. Or my personal favorite with drums is a backwards reverb, because you can do any impulse response this impulse response may be completely the opposite in time of what you would actually hear in a reverb space. So if I stop it, you can actually hear the, the uh, reversed reverb sound of that. OK, so we've talked a lot about how to, um, how to, build, these, uh, how to build these processing systems. I want to talk for a minute about how to synthesize sound, how to do musical applications of sound, not just provide kind of ambient environments for sound. First and foremost, it's actually really easy to do this. Um, if you go and look at the, like, just do a search for web audio API demos, there's a whole bunch of demos out there that are different, uh, different synthesizers. This is only one of them. It's actually a fairly simplistic one, which is why I use it. But it has controls for all, all of these different things that I'm, I'm playing around with. It's actually the hardest part about building something like this is providing the user experience for it. I've actually built a testbed uh, synthesizer app that has no UI at all, and it's really easy. Like the actual sound production, I want to build an envelope, I want to stick a filter in, I want to control some other properties of it, is like a dozen lines of code. The rest of it, the shell for you know, drawing knobs and everything else, is actually a lot more, more troublesome. And remember when I mentioned before, you can actually connect audio nodes to audio params as well. For those of you who are synth geeks like me, because I've loved synthesizers since I was about 12, um, this is how you get things like low frequency oscillators. It's how you do things like FM synthesis. They're actually just intersecting two different audio signals and, or multiplying them together. So the first and most fu fundamental piece of generating sound is an oscillator. Oscillators provide a periodic waveform source. It's going to draw for you or, or create for you things like a sine wave, square wave, sawtooth wave, and a triangle wave. Those all sound kind of vaguely similar. It's because I didn't alter the pitch. I haven't filtered them. They're not super complex waveforms, but they are different, and they have very different harmonic characteristics, which give you some interesting properties. So an oscillator is an audio source node. It's an audio node that you can connect up to a destination. It lets you control the frequency um, in hertz. It actually also lets you control the frequency with a detune parameter. Um, Detuning basically lets you control using a different unit known as sense. Sense are great for musical applications because in an equal tempered scale, there's 100 cents per note. So it's super easy to say, I want you know, three octaves up. Like it's three times 12 um, times 100. And just like audio buffer source node, you have note on, note off, and that sort of thing. Now, I did skip that we have another type up there called custom. Custom lets us use this really interesting oscillator called a wavetable oscillator. Wavetables are not a sample playback buffer. Uh, the term got misused in the late 80s and early 90s for a while. It's actually a, a way to produce sound that uses, um, that looks like my page didn't load, hang on. Let's try this again. There we go. Um, it creates waveforms from by adding different uh, coefficients onto harmonic partials. So it basically stacks up harmonics of the same tone and then lets you control how much of each harmonic to draw or, or to play, to add to the waveform. 
So here we start out with a fairly simple set of harmonics. There's three harmonics playing. And it sounds pretty basic, like it's not a very rich sound or anything. But I can draw in more. And you can get a lot more interesting sound. So this is kind of weird. It's a very uh, deep area to build complex waveforms because you can sit there and tweak the partials all you want. Um, but I don't want to go too deeply into it because it's going to, like, we could just sit here and play with partials all day. It's a different way of creating sounds. It's a different generation system. It actually was very popular in the early 80s. There was a P PPG wave synthesizer that, that kind of kicked off the usage of this. The great thing to me is this creates very rich, uh, spectrum-rich sound. It creates a lot of harmonics, which was super useful in building the vocoder. Um, the, the sound that I used for that vocoder is actually a wavetable. Okay, so we've created sound. Now we need to process it a little bit more, and there are a couple of nodes, uh, node types that are really musically interesting. The first of these is compressor node. Now, compressors are a very common musical tool. In fact, that um, picture of a a rack of music equipment that's actually from my basement studio. One of the units in that is a hardware compressor. And compression basically controls the volume peaks of a sound, but tries to increase the overall volume. So like this, this is a before and after picture of the same sound sample of me playing my bass guitar. The first one is uncompressed, the second one is compressed. I've actually like increased the average volume, but I've had to turn it down in a couple of places to make sure that um, that I don't spike past the, you know, the, past the clipping range. So this is kind of like having an engineer who sits there with his hand on the volume knob with an extremely fast reaction time. You can actually see how this works here. These are really standardized um, controls, by the way, like the, the audio params that give you controls on compressor node for threshold, knee, ratio, attack, and release. These are the five standard things that you get on a compressor. Like, there's actually knobs that say threshold, knee, ratio, attack, and release on that hardware compressor that I have. Now, the little bouncing red bar shows you how much compression is being applied at any given point in time. So I can crank the threshold down, crank the knee up, crank the ratio up. And you can probably tell in the back, it sounds a little muddled for me, um, but you can probably tell in the back, suddenly the peaks aren't so loud, but the whole sound is kind of like, it's a little bit muddled right now, actually, um, because you don't generally over compress like this. If you want to, you can change the attack time and you'll start hearing some of the, some of the poppiness of the attacks back, which is why you have all these different controls. So, I'm not gonna do a class in how to use compressors. I just wanted to say, this is a tool that we have. Um, the last processing node tool in our toolbox is a wave shaper node. Wave shapers are a little bit complex to explain. Basically what they do is they let you have, they let you create a curve, a response curve, that's like a sample lookup table. And it happens on every sound sample. So for every sample it says, am I actually gonna return this? If I, if I set a curve that was actually just a flat line um, on a 45 degree angle down here, then it would actually just have the output be exactly the same as the input. Otherwise, it's gonna change the waveforms that go through. Not control the volume over time like a compressor node, but actually change the waveforms and kind of squish the peaks down a little bit. So I can use this to create like distortion and overdrive. So here, we have me playing the guitar. And uh, if I just drive the gain a little bit more to push up into the areas that get clipped off, you can hear it sounds like a guitar distortion pedal or me overdriving an amplifier. And this is just a, a single sound curve that I created and shoved into there. You can actually change these curves infinitely. Like you can give it any size of array curve that you want and you can change what the response looks like and get very, very different distortion effects. Okay, almost there. Um, so I haven't mentioned mono sound versus stereo sound versus 
5.1 surround sound or anything like that, mostly because the Web Audio API, for the most part, just kind of handles it for you. Like, you don't have to deal with channels. It just sort of magically upgrades whenever it needs to go to stereo if you have a mono signal, or you know, upgrades all the way to 5.1 surround sound if it has to, whatever. If you really do want to poke into channel control, you can do that. Most of those connections are actually, they may be more than one channel, and you just don't have to worry about whether it's, uh, whether it's a mono or a stereo signal. If you want to, you use an audio channel splitter and an audio channel merger. So for example, I mentioned a ping pong delay. Ping pong delay bounces the delay back and forth between the left and the right channels. So it sounds kind of like this. Hopefully you hear that bouncing between the, the channels back there. You, you accomplish this just by taking two delays, feeding the original signal into one side, and then crossing the feedback loop. So it goes from the left channel output into the right channel's delay node, and then back the same way the other direction. And of course, you can individually control in here how long the delay is for each side and that kind of stuff. So um, I mentioned at the very beginning, you can actually plug in and do any kind of custom JavaScript uh, you want to on a sound node. JavaScript audio node is how you do that. You plug in, you set up an event listener, and then you process buffers of audio in that event listener. I'm not going to go into the demo of this. It's really subtle, and it takes a lot of explaining. And we are, have about three minutes left, I think. Um, so, but this is how you do it. It's, there's some pretty good examples of how to do it on, uh, on the Chromium site. And I want to jump to where we are with web audio. Like one of the first questions is always, so is this Chrome only? And it is supported in Chrome, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Uh, Chrome OS actually just enabled it as well, so we have it on, on Chrome OS. But even more interestingly, Safari has now enabled it in nightly builds, and it's shipping in the Safari 5.2 beta. And my personal favorite, it's now in the iOS 6 betas also. So you can get the web audio API on your iPhone or iPad. Um, Apple actually covered the Web Audio API in one of their sessions in WWDC earlier this month, which I thought was great. And we have some really uh, active discussion going on on the Web Audio Working Group, of which I'm a member. We have a bunch of active participants from Mozilla, Opera, the Internet Explorer team, a bunch of other industry people as well, helping to get the specification to the point where we can get rid of that vendor prefix and turn it into a solid standard. And of course, if you need it today, though, in other browsers, use Chrome Frame. I promised I would plug for Chrome Frame, so. So, we are just about out of time, um, but I did want to call out two features that I'm actually really excited about coming up in the future. They're not quite there yet, so I can't demo them really, um, but they are exciting. And I also want to uh, kind of paint a picture of what I really hope people build and what I'm really excited about building. First and foremost, um, I'm super pumped to have audio input. I, uh, Jan can tell you I keep pinging the team, like, when am I going to get my audio input? When am I going to get my audio input? Mostly because I want to plug a live microphone into my vocoder and do stuff like that, like plug my guitar in and you know, create my own guitar amp simulators and stuff like that, because they're pretty easy to do using the web audio API. Not quite there yet. Hopefully will be in the near future. The second one is one that is a little bit further out, um, but I'm actually the co-editor of a proposal in the W3C to do MIDI input. Some of you up front may notice that I'm, I've actually driven some of these demos off a little keyboard here. Um, I'm cheating because that uses a plugin, and I've just hardwired the plugin in to do the appropriate thing. But the specification that I'm co-editing um, will in, in eventually allow us to have that as part of the web platform, and we can natively just handle MIDI input. So you can do controllers, you can access external synthesizers, and do all kinds of cool stuff. Light shows are generally driven by MIDI as well, like all the controllers for the fancy lights last night are driven through that. Now, for awesome apps that I really want to see people build, there's tons of them. First and foremost, great game audio, like really richly interactive. Don't just make it beep. Make it beep differently depending on you know, how some parameter I can't even think of, like how fast someone's running or whatever. 
but we have the tools to build shared music composition tools and digital audio workstations and all this kind of stuff today. So with that, no deck is complete without tons of references. Um, you don't have to memorize these because the deck's posted. You don't even have to memorize the thing at the top because it's on my last slide in a shortened form and it'll be easier to read. If you don't already follow Chrome developers on Google+, please add us to a circle. We do lots of communication there, but we do try to keep it nice and concise and useful and interesting. And with that, thank you. Um, we're basically out of time, but I'm gonna be around now. I'll be outside uh, once we've packed up here, and I'll be doing office hours for the next hour or two, too, if you have other questions. Thanks.